Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Christ is risen. He truly is risen. Today's gospel, which we've heard, of course, many times, we see this man being challenged about something that happened to him, as we are often challenged for living our faith, and for trying to be faithful Christians in this world. In the preceding section before this gospel, the Lord has just finished having a debate with the Jews in the temple, and he says, of course, that Abraham rejoiced to see my day and was glad. They say, you are not yet 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham. And he says to them, of course, those very powerful, powerful words, I tell you before Abraham was, I am. Professing himself, of course, to be God, speaking the unspeakable name of God. And of course, at this point, they desire to kill him, and it says that he passes right through them without being touched to the temple. That's a miracle in itself. We let these little things pass by in the scriptures, these details which are amazing. How did he do that? Well, because he was God, and it was not yet his time. Does he stop his ministry for fear? Does he back down because of all the tension? Hardly. He goes, and of course he finds this blind man who had been blind for all these years from birth. And what does he do? He makes mud, he puts it in his eyes, and tells him to go wash in the pool of Silvan. Out of humility. He could have done it right then. But he does a wonderful thing. As you listen to the services last night, throughout the vigil, it said that the Lord gave him eyes, that the Lord made eyes. St. Irenaeus, St. John Chrysostom, and many others of their early fathers don't say that he just restored his sight. He gave him eyes. He didn't have eyes. And no doctor that I know of yet can just give someone eyes, certainly not on the spot. And the Lord gives the man eyes after saying, I am. And he goes away out of humility. He doesn't sit here to glory in the fact that this man can now see. And of course the people see this and are in awe. They've seen this man many times. They know that he can't see. They know his lot in life. So, of course, people began to ask him how this happened. He goes through this wonderful dialogue with the people. This man came and restored my sight. So, of course, the leaders of the temple get involved in this, and they don't like this. They've already been mad at Jesus several times over. And in this case, he's done yet another undeniable miracle that they have a problem with. So they try to make it out like it's not him. But it's just like him. But he, of course, professed that it was, in fact, him, and others knew that it was him. He's risking saying things, because they wanted, of course, to say that he is a sinner. He says, I do not know that he's a sinner. He thinks he's a prophet. He healed my eyes. Sinners don't typically do these things. Certainly they don't create eyes. And they proceed on with this. They finally go... After trying to beat him down, after trying to intimidate him, they go and find his parents. His parents have a wonderful opportunity to confess something here. And they say, of course, we know that our son was born blind. And they say, he is of age, ask him. Because they feared what would happen to him. They were being intimidated. They would be cast out of the temple for speaking against the common thought for what the Pharisees wanted, for what the leaders were pushing for. So they ask him again. Of course, we have this wonderful dialogue where he almost has sort of a, not an arrogance, but a great boldness about himself. It's a marvelous thing that he has opened my eyes. You do not know where he is from. You wish to be his disciples as well. Humility, but boldness in Christ. And they cast him out. It doesn't say what else happened with him in the past, but this is not good. Because a man cast out of the synagogue, out of the temple, couldn't get a job, couldn't trade the marketplace, certainly didn't have friends, no one would be around him. But he did not fear this boldness. We too should not fear being bold for our faith. And of course we know in this age it's become increasingly difficult to be a Christian. In this society, some societies are coming back from it being that difficult. In Russia, where it was difficult to be a Christian, now it's not so difficult to be a Christian. Thank God. They came back with boldness, those martyrs who fought for the faith. 
But in this country, I know I have a, a niece who was told in a, in a public high school in South Carolina that she couldn't wear a cross in public because it would offend people. To her credit, she told them she was wearing a cross. Reminds me of me a little bit. She's bold. <laughs> and family ties are strong. And so she confessed her faith. It's not a politically correct thing to be a Christian anymore. You can't talk about this in public. Don't do this. Don't put up a cross. Don't put up a Christmas tree. God forbid. Us, among ourselves, we fear to keep a fast because people will know what we're doing and that will be offensive. I think about St. Nikolai Velimirovich, the great Serbian hierarch who lived in the last century, who, of course, died at St. Tikhon's. St. Nikolai, one time while living by the lake of Okrid, the king of Serbia came to visit him. St. Nikolai was a well-known and powerful man. And the king comes in and, of course, the servants come immediately to serve the king and they bring him on a platter of fish. Now, this is like a Wednesday or a Friday. St. Nikolai proceeds to stand up, grab the tray, throw it out the window into Lake Okrid and says, certainly a king of Serbia would not eat fish on a fast day. The king, of course, is shocked and doesn't know what to say, and not many people would stand up to Nikolai Vilimirovich. But he taught us something, boldness in the faith, not to be ashamed of our faith, not to worry about what the world thinks, not to worry if they're going to kick us out of the synagogue, or out of the job, or out of the local club that we belong to, or whatever organization, or the community, or the street we belong to, the neighborhood association, not to worry about these things. People are often tempted in our society not to act as Christians, to dress as Christians. Well, of course, in my case, it's a little more obvious than most, but we can, we can still be modest. I have had many clergy in my life, clergy, tell me, oh, Father, you don't need to wear that out, do you? Or we're going out? Of course I do. Absolutely. It brings to mind St. Paisios the Athenite, who a priest came to the Holy Mountain to visit him wearing secular clothing because he didn't feel comfortable going out in public this way. As if St. Paisios wouldn't know. Well, St. Paisios knew and didn't get his blessing. And he says something to him about wearing his casket. And he makes comments about how you know, outdated and difficult this is becoming in the society. So St. Paisios tells him to go over to that olive tree he has over there and strip the bark off of it. We'll see it tomorrow. He says, but it will die if I do that. He said, and so does a priest who doesn't wear his cassock at all times and in all places. Confession for the faith is absolutely essential. You know that story of St. Nikolai himself, while in Dachau, being mocked constantly by the Nazi soldiers. And they told him, of course, deny Christ. You, know, you still believe in your Christ. And at some point he looks up at them with flames in his eyes and says, no. And they laugh. He says, I know him now. I've seen him. This is boldness in the faith. We must have that boldness of this man, this blind man, who had nothing in the world, no strength. Even his own parents were understandably fearful, as we all are fearful in our confession of faith. But we must realize that in life, as I've said many times, we can lose everything. Every single thing, our house, our wife, our husband, our children, our health, our money, everything. None of that is definitely going to be there for us continually. But there is always Christ. But at least I have Christ. But that's the wrong thing to say because Christ fills all in all. He is everything himself. He is all that we need. He is the one thing needful. And if those other things, of course, are part of that equation, glory be to God. But if not, there is Christ. And for this man, who all of a sudden has nothing, what does Christ do? He seeks him out. Once again, being bold, taking a chance. He seeks him out and tells him who he is. And ministers to him and takes care of him. 
And I can assure you that when the world falls apart around you, everything is not the way you think it should be, and really truly bad things do happen, Christ does seek you out. We just have to open our hearts, to open our spiritual eyes and be open to that presence because He does come every single time. And when you confess God before men, He will confess you before His angels in heaven, before His Father is in heaven. If you keep your fasts, if you come to church, if you say your prayers, if you are humble, if you be the one who doesn't gossip, if you're the one who does dress modestly, if you're the one who continues to act like a priest despite what the world around you says, the one who doesn't back down to the Nazis or the proverbial Nazis, the ones that we have now who are opposed to the faith, Christ still comes and heals your eyes and gives you spiritual eyes to see the one thing needful. We might stand in the presence of our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.